again. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. That's a southern welcome, y'all. <laughs> y'all. Y'all. Paul's a Paul is from the south because Paul said uh, he said y'all. And uh, anyway, uh, turning your Bibles to First Samuel chapter fifteen and verse twenty-three as we get ready to get started today. Uh, welcome to Bible Believers Community Church, where the name says it all. And by golly. I'm Pastor Jeff Dan. I'm happy you're here with us today and pray that this would, uh, I pray it'd be a blessing to you, but more than likely, um, it's a type of message that tends to offend people and bother people. You know, when I hear of Christians that get offended, especially through biblical teaching, the Bible says that if you're saved, nothing shall offend you. <laughs> <laughs> and so when people get so easily offended by a message, it makes you um, a little bit curious as to, you know, we don't have the ability to say, well, they're not saved, they got offended. That that would be wrong. You can be saved and out of the will of God. Amen. Yeah. But you shouldn't be offended. We're going to talk about, we've been talking about the spirit world, and we're going to talk about the spirit of rebellion today. The spirit of rebellion. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22, the Bible says, uh, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Here, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Just hang tight. Here we have King Saul went contrary. He was told to go into battle and to wipe everything out, kill every animal, every human, kill everything. And they kept the best animals. And so Samuel comes up upon Saul and Saul says, I obeyed the voice of the Lord. And Samuel says, and what's the sound of this bleeding in my, you know, the sheep and the bah, bah, and the cows, mm. and Samuel says, what's the sound of all these animals in my ears then? If you did what you were supposed to do, why am I hearing all these animals? And Saul said, well, we kept all the best to do sacrifice unto the Lord. And so Samuel says, have the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as he does in obedience. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be obedient, right? As the obeying of the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now here's our key verse. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We praise you. God, we just... This world is so messed up. It's so filled with rebellion. Our political leaders are rebellious. The whole world is rebellious. And so, Lord, we, we pray for America that you'd put a handle, get a, get a hold on, on our politicians and all our rulers, Lord. I pray for their salvation first and foremost. And then I pray that even if they don't get saved, they'd start living godly, they'd start doing things that are right and just, and God, uh, we just pray that you'd help us to, if this word, if this uh, message seems to strike a nerve, Lord, that we would uh, listen and be attentive. And God, that your Holy Ghost could have the do the work that only He can do to change hearts and to make us see truth. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, this is one of those real popular messages that God gave me, and Lisa. I got to tell you, Lisa loves this kind of message because God didn't give me this message until yesterday afternoon or something like that. And, and normally God gives me messages at, at least a good week in advance, sometimes more than that. But Lisa says, Lisa was asked me all through the week, has God given you a message yet? Nope. Has God given you a message yet? Nope. <laughs> and finally it was like either Friday or yesterday, one of the two, and Lisa said, it must have been Friday. And Lisa says, God giving you the message yet? And I go, no. And she goes, good. I love it when he waits till the last minute <laughs> to give it to you. <laughs> and and uh, so uh, she may love it that he waits till the last minute. I don't love it that he waits till the last minute. But they usually turn out pretty good. But it's the type of message that most Christians today don't want to hear. That's, a, that's the reality of it. Most Christians don't want to hear about being rebellious. Most Christians like to go to churches that aren't churches at all. They're, um, they're uh, life improvement <laughs> seminars. They're, um, they're motivational speakers. They're not somebody that tells you your true condition. 
You know, where did preachers lose sight of the fact, you know, Jesus said, unless you hate your father, your mother, and even your own self, <laughs> mm -hmm. you're not worthy of the kingdom of God. Yeah. What, what happened to preachers that got that? So preachers are, are they, they change from teaching you that you are in trouble, teaching you that your attitude is bad. They change from that to teaching you, Let's go to the Jesus Santa Claus and get what you want out of life. Mm -hmm. That's what they've changed to. Yeah. And Jesus isn't a Santa Claus. No. And Jesus isn't interested in you getting everything you can out of this life. He's interested. Remember our verse? God, God would rather have obedience than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And God's interested in you being obedient to his word even when it goes all the way against society. When it goes all the way against what the world's trying to get you to fall into and believe. And so we're going to talk about the spirit of rebellion. The Bible said in our opening text that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Yeah. God has some things to say about rebellion and he has some things to say about witchcraft and they go hand in hand. God said, suffer not a witch to live. Amen. That's what God said. Yeah. And our society today is loaded with witches and warlocks and Satanists and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And if we were to listen, I'm, and, and I got to be, be careful when I say stuff like this because there's ears on the internet and they'll say I'm trying to incite violence. I'm not. God didn't say for me to go kill a witch. He said, suffer not a witch to live. Let Leave that. God also said, vengeance is mine, say it the Lord. And so right. leave it in the hands of God. God will deal with the witch. Mm -hmm. But man, the witch is... is uh, Boy, they're on such dangerous ground and they don't even know it. And some have been deceived by Satan into thinking, well, I'm a good witch. There's no such thing as a good witch. Yeah. The Bible doesn't say suffer not a bad witch to live. It says suffer not a witch to live. Right. Witches are evil. There's no such thing as a good witch. So rebellion, I'm going to start off because we're talking about the spirit of rebellion. I'm going to start off and give you a definition of the word rebellion. The word rebellion is a noun. Now, if you don't know what a noun is, um, we're going to do we're going to do a, a quick English lesson. A noun is a person, place, or thing, and so rebellion is a thing. It's not a place, and it's not a person. It's a thing, and so you got verbs. Verbs are action words. Verbs are like run is a verb, uh, study is a verb, but a noun refers to a person, a place, or a thing. So rebellion is a thing. The first, and I got two definitions. These definitions come from uh, the 1828 Webster's defin, uh, Dictionary of the English Language. I always use the 1828 Dictionary because Noah Webster actually used a King James Bible in coming up with his definitions. <laughs> and so uh, the Webster Dictionary of today is not the same as the Webster's Dictionary of 1828. The Webster Dictionary of 1828 was the dictionary that was put together by Noah Webster. Now it's put together by a conglomeration of worldly people and they mm -hmm. don't care anything about God. And, you know, I own a copy of the Webster 1828 dictionary. It's in my office on my desk. And they're fairly expensive. But guess what? You can go on the internet and type in Webster 1828 dictionary and you'll have everything in the Webster 1828 dictionary right there at your fingertips for free. <laughs> and so uh, if you need to look up a word and you're doing a Bible study, I would recommend the Webster 1828 Dictionary. So the first definition for rebellion is an open and avowed renunciation of the authority of government to which one owes allegiance or the taking of arms tra traitorously to resist the authority of lawful government to revolt. The second defi definition is open resistant to lawful authority. So this definition brings up an interesting question. It's a question that probably should be considered. And when you read definitions, you shouldn't just read a definition and go, okay, that's the definition of the word. You should look at it and say, okay, do I have any questions based on this definition? Mm -hmm. And this should bring up a question. The question should be what constitutes or what is a lawful authority? Because it talks about lawful authority. 
What is a lawful authority? What constitutes lawful authority? Well, the Bible gives us some guidance on lawful authority. It does. Uh, and we're going to go into different parts of this lawful authority as we do a deeper dive on this message. We're going to go deeper and deeper. I don't know if we'll get it done today or if you, you guys know me. I'm not in any rush. It may take a week or two or three or 17. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to just do as God leads me to do. So um, the obvious uh, identification of what a lawful uh, authority is is found right in our dictionary definition of this word rebellion. And that would be, uh, and, and prior to going into that, into some specifics of rebellion, I first want to make a couple points about rebellion that many don't ever think about. Did you know that uh, m most people who are rebellious don't even realize they're being rebellious? Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. Most people think that, that, that they're okay and that they're not a rebellious person, and yet they are. They're rebellious. Yeah. Some people believe that they're sticking up for their rights. Mm -hmm. We're seeing rebellion all over the country today where people are saying, I'm just sticking up for my rights. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a great preacher who, whose name is Jack Hiles. I used to um, listen to every message Jack Hiles preached years and years and years, probably... 40 years ago. <laughs> he used to listen to every message that Jack Hiles preached. He was a good preacher. He was a Baptist preacher out of Hammond, Indiana, which is right across the river from Chicago, Illinois. And uh, he once preached a message, you have no right to all your rights. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a good message. Mm -hmm. You have no right to all your rights. And uh, I'm not going to re-preach that message, but people think that they're sticking up for their, their rights and in truth, they're being rebellious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. They're not sticking up for rights. They're trying to impose rights that they don't really have, is what they're trying to do. And yep. so it's possible to stick up for your rights without being rebellious. I don't want to give the idea that if you're sticking up for rights, you're automatically rebellious, because it's possible to stick up for your rights without being rebellious. But especially in the time that we lived in, and almost always, almost always, not always, almost always turns to rebellion. So that's the first point I want to make. Second point is you can protest without being rebellious, but oftentimes rebellion is denied by people stating they are simply protesting. Now, I'm not talking about standing up for your rights now. I'm talking about protesting. You can protest without being rebellious, but most times in the day that we live in, those protests turn to open rebellion. Mm -hmm. And so when a protest turns from a peaceful demonstration of thought provoking speeches into riots, it crosses the line between protesting and rebellion. Mm -hmm. to, to stand with signs and have somebody get up on a platform and speak, even if it goes against what everybody wants to hear, that's not necessarily rebellion. It can be, but more than likely it's not because it's just a peaceful conversation where we're trying to provoke thought, we're trying to get some ideas across. And, and actually, I think oftentimes when you're in a discussion, especially where there's disagreement, if both parties can keep their head, <laughs> mm -hmm. those thought-provoking uh, conversations and such are very beneficial for everybody involved. Yeah. Now, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're faced with something like that, this is going to be a tricky one because you have to have an open mind to listen to the other side, but you can't have an open mind that's so open you'll fall for anything. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and what do we do normally when we're in that kind of uh, conversation? We build walls. Mm -hmm. we, because I already believe what I believe and there's nothing you're going to say that's going to change the way I believe. And so we build up these walls. In Sunday school, we talked a little bit about you got to be careful because there's been false teachings throughout all the centuries of Christianity. And you may have been taught a false teaching that is ingrained in you because you were taught it and taught it and taught it and reinforced, reinforced, reinforced. Mm -hmm. And I gave myself as an example where I said, 
there were things that I believed after I was saved for 10 years that now haven't been saved for, gosh, 30. No, more than that. More than that. But anyhow, over 40 years I've been saved, but I think, but yeah, because Mike's over 40. I got saved before he was born. So at any rate, there's things that I believed 10 years after I got saved that after reading my Bible and studying my Bible and studying my Bible and studying my Bible, I go, oh my gosh, that isn't, that isn't true. That's a false teaching. Mm -hmm. And it took the Holy Ghost to open my eyes and show me the false teaching, but they exist. And we always have to be, listen, I can listen to a preacher that when they start off, I go, oh, that guy's blasphemous, but I'll listen to him. And I'll go and I'll read the Bible because maybe they're right. Maybe I was taught something false. Maybe they're right. But I don't become the final authority and I don't allow that person to become the final authority. Mm -hmm. And what I said in Sunday school is just because I say something that goes against something that's been ingrained in you, don't automatically believe it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Use the Bible. Let the Bible be the final authority. And if you have one verse that has led to that ingrained belief, and I can show you 15 verses that say contrary, you probably misapplied the one verse. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, uh, you cannot change governmental authority or God-given authority through acts of violence. That's rebellion. Do we agree with that statement? Yes. Uh -huh. Because I'm going to challenge your whole thought of American history with that statement. You cannot change governmental authority or God-given authority through acts of violence. No. Um, that's rebellion. We'll, we'll come back to that thought a little bit later. Third thing I want to point out, well, actually, let's talk about it right now. The third thing I want to talk about about rebellion and that last thought that you can't, through acts of violence, change God-given authority. What about the Revolutionary War between America and Great Britain? America was, was colonized and founded by Great Britain, right? And America was under the leadership of, and the authority of the King of England. And it was a revolt. We revolted, a revolutionary war. We revolted against the authority that God put in place. And, and uh, it's a rebellious act that may seem yeah. noble. We like the outcome of that act, don't we? I mean, I'm, I love America. I'm glad that we're not under British rule. Yeah. <laughs> Amen? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I love America. So, But the act that they did was an act of rebellion. It's true. It was. Yeah. And so uh, I'm not going to say that it's noble. Uh, many see it as noble. I kind of like how it turned out, but I can't necessarily say it was noble because it was an act of rebellion. But most would say, no, that was noble. That was righteous indignation. <laughs> it was a revolt against the government that our country was founded by. Mm -hmm. uh, if you stop and think about that whole thing in the context of the Bible in this message and determine if you believe it was the right thing to do or not. I mean, I'm not gonna make that decision for you. What I would like you to do, because I'm gonna give you some ideas about rebellion that maybe you've never thought about, mm -hmm. and then I want you to prayerfully and, and uh, thoughtfully think about, okay, let's think about some things in history. Was the Revolutionary War, an act of rebellion. Because I can make an argument either way that it was an act of rebellion and no, it wasn't an act of rebellion. And I'll get into that idea a little bit later when we talk about the Civil War. Mm -hmm. It won't be very much later, but a little bit later. So is it another, uh, uh, is it the, was it the right thing to do? Was it right for America to split ties in the form of a rebellion against Great Britain, the kingdom that sent us over here <laughs> to begin with. So now let's talk about the Civil War. But we should uh, be 
pretty careful about how we think about either one of these. Uh, I, I'm trying to give you some thoughts about rebellion because you know what we don't do? We don't like, we're not driving to the grocery store saying, man, just what has been rebellious over the years? <laughs> we, we don't do that. Right. You know, so I'm trying to, because the Bible has some specific things to say about rebellion, we should give some consideration to what is rebellious. Yes. Because if we don't, then we're liable ourselves. Can a Christian be rebellious? Mm -hmm. Yes, it happens yeah. all the time. Okay. I can say that when I was first called to preach, I was rebellious because I didn't want to be a preacher. Mm -hmm. And so I dug in my heels and said, no, I wasn't called to preach. Mm -hmm. And uh, other preachers would come up to me and, you know, they'd say, hey, could you, could you speak this day and not speak? And they'd come to me and say, oh my gosh, God must have called you to preach. No, God didn't call me to preach. <laughs> And uh, you can even ask Lisa, there was times when with uh, when we first got together that I was still struggling with that battle and she'd just roll her eyes. And she, she never tried to interject and she'd say, God's got to deal with him. You know what she does to me? It's not fair. She always turns God loose on me. She, she does. It's not fair. She'll, she'll, like if I'm out of line on something, she'll just go off and she'll pray and she'll say, God, he's your kid. Deal with him. <laughs> And God might take me to the woodshed, who knows? So, the Civil War. Um, when considering the Civil War in America, or any country, a Civil War, uh, or even the Revolutionary War, I guess we could, we could put that in the same bucket. There are some things that need to be considered. Mm -hmm. The Civil War, as an example, the American Civil War, the South didn't launch a war against the North. No. They didn't. So, I would conclude that the South wasn't really being rebellious. Uh, the South made the decision that they didn't want to be part of the United States of America anymore. And the way our Constitution was set up, they really had the right to make that decision. Yes. They, they really did. Because when our government was set up, when the, when the founders of America put together the Constitution, the Constitution was based on individual state rights. Yes. The states governed the states, not the federal government. The federal government had no say. When America was first, people are going to say, no, you're wrong, but I'm right. When this country was first established, the federal government had no right to tell any state, you will do this or you will do that. The states were self-governing under the federal government. And so... The federal government, um, historically, they decided to impose a federal uh, set of regulations, if you will, or laws that every state had to abide by. Yeah. And the South said, no, you're not going to infringe upon our rights. Now, that's truly, the, the Civil War in America wasn't about slavery. Slavery became an issue in the Civil War about midway through the Civil War. Yeah. The Civil War started when Abraham Lincoln said, the states will do this, that, and the other. One of the issues was slavery. That was one of the issues. Yeah. And the southern states said, no. You don't have the right to tell us what we will and will not do. We are self-governing. We will decide what we will and will not do. And the federal government said, no, you will do this. Mm -hmm. And the southern states, kind of like America sent a letter to a declaration of independence to England, the southern states sent a declaration to the, the capital of the United States saying, we're not going to be part of the United States anymore. We're going to form our own Confederate government. Mm -hmm. And the North declared war on the South to bring them back into the fold. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now here's where you start getting in trouble. Some people think that Abraham Lincoln was one of the greatest presidents this country ever had. And he did more damage to this country than any other president historically, maybe with the exception of our current president. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because when the Constitution was... Um, put into place and the states were given individual rights, that's the way this government should run and it hasn't run that way ever since the Civil War. Now the federal government dictates, federal law takes precedence over mm -hmm. state laws. 
-hmm. which is wrong. Yeah. And you, you can see the end result of it just by looking at Capitol Hill and looking at what Congress and the Senate do on a continual basis. Yeah. Well, I watched something the other day that just boiled my blood. And it was a situation where, and, and it was actually a hearing in Congress, and, and Jim Jordan, I think he's a congressman from Ohio, I think, but he was actually trying to shine the light on something that he thought was wrong. And he said the the federal Congress, the, the federal congressmen, not the state congressmen, are the ones that establish laws of the land. They're the ones that have the oversight of all issues of government. The ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, has been implementing laws on their own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doing whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they have made laws that are so ambiguous that they can't even define what they mean. Mm -hmm. So to, I'll try to make a long story short, it might be impossible, but what they did was there was a gentleman that was a hobbyist gun dealer. A hobbyist gun dealer. Now, what does that mean? That means that they can own weapons that the average person can't own. Mm -hmm. And the ATF made a change in a rule that made it to where this guy had to go get a license where he had been doing being a hobbyist gun dealer for decades without having a license. He had to go get a license. And he didn't know he had it because they didn't inform him. He didn't know. So at like 2 o'clock in the morning, the ATF shows up with 30 cops. They shut off the power to his house and phone. and phone. They took tape and put it over his ring doorbell so he couldn't tell who was outside of his house. He just knew somebody was outside of his house. They kicked in his door. He heard the big bash on the door. Now, if you were just an average drill sitting in your house and you had guns and your power shut off and somebody kicked in your door and you didn't know who it was, what would you do? Well, he grabbed his gun and told his wife to stay in the bedroom, which she didn't listen to him. And he said, I'll go deal with this. You stay here in the bedroom and hide. She didn't listen to him. She followed him out. And he went and all he saw was guys in dark clothes because they were dressed totally in black, nothing that said police, nothing that said ATF, nothing, just guys in black charging into his house. Mm -hmm. He took his handgun and he shot at the floor in front of them just to try and get them to run. He wasn't trying to shoot any of them. He was shooting the floor in front of them, trying to get them to leave his house, to scare them. They shot him in the head and killed him. Yeah. And his wife saw the whole thing. Oh. And now it's a lawsuit against the federal government. Mm -hmm. That's the federal government taking rights over a state. That's the end result of something like and it's out of control and it's not going to get any better. No. And so we can't really have a revolution in the United States. That's rebellion as Christians. So as I'm, I, I got to say this over and over again throughout this message. This isn't a call to arms. We're Christians. Mm -hmm. We don't go to arms. We're not violent. No. This isn't a call to be rebellious. It's quite contrary. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see why it's contrary as we go through this message. It's contrary to be rebellious against the country in which you live in. Mm -hmm. So historically, a person could paint the picture that the North actually rebelled against the South, not vice versa, because the North was the one that declared war on the South, not the South declaring war. And the South, according to our Constitution at the time, had the right to secede from the United States of America and become their own country. Yeah. And the North declared war on them, re rebelling against that authority. Uh, then the North took it upon themselves to exercise authority over the individual states. The question would be, did the federal government have the authority to make a massive change like that on their own? My conclusion would be no, but it doesn't matter, it happened. Mm -hmm. right? right? 
So then the follow-up question would be, in doing so, was the South being rebellious when they decided that they were not going to sit for that change that was technically unlawful? Was that a form of rebellion, or were they just saying, nah, we're not so much going to do that. We're just going to, you guys live in peace. We're going to do our own thing down here and have our own country. I don't think that's rebellion, but I can't answer that for you. I think these are things I want you to prayerfully consider. Uh, I don't have the answer to that question. But here's something you can think about, and this is my fifth point about I want you to think about rebellion. We haven't even gotten into it yet. I just want you to think about acts of rebellion, whether you believe they were rebellion, whether God would call it rebellion, because it really doesn't matter whether you'd call it rebellion or not. The question you should really ask, mm -hmm. would God call this rebellion? Mm -hmm. That's the question you should yeah. ask. Yeah. This thing that took place historically, would God call that rebellion? I mean, we could even ask the question, uh, would God look at what our federal government is doing and saying the American politicians have rebelled against the foundation of America? You can be rebellious without shooting a, a shot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you you yeah. can be rebellious without going to war. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. So here's something to think about when you think about authority and whether there or not there was rebellion involved. Because if you remember the definition it said, it talked about lawful authority. Yes. Well, if it talks about lawful authority, there must be a such thing as unlawful mm -hmm. authority. Yeah. Rebellion deals with lawful authority, not unlawful authority. So as we're considering the question of the American Revolution or the Civil War, either one, did England, if we go to the Revolutionary War, did they have lawful authority over America or was it unlawful authority over America? Because if there was unlawful authority, I think we'd have to conclude that that wasn't an act of rebellion. Mm -hmm. It was an act of self-governance, mm -hmm. maybe. And then you can ask that same question about the Civil War. If your government changes drastically and you decide you don't want to submit yourself to those changes and decide to move to another state or country, I'm not talking about going to war with them. I'm not talking about starting another civil war or another revolution. <laughs> if I'm living in California, I'm using that because people are fleeing California like crazy right now. If I'm living in California and the political scene in California got so corrupt, so ugly, so liberal that I don't want to submit myself to those rules and regulations and I decide to move to, I'm going to pick some place that I don't want to move to. So I'm not going to say Colorado because I don't want them coming here. If I decide to move to uh, Connecticut. That's a good place. Blue to blue, right? <laughs> and they decide to move to Connecticut. Is that an act of rebellion that they left the state to go someplace else to fall under a different set of rules that they could live by? Absolutely not. No. If America got so bad, I don't know what country you could go to that would be better than America, but if America got so bad that you didn't, I, I, at one point I thought Australia would be a place to go if America got really bad, but now Australia is worse than America. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember the prime minister, I think it's a prime minister in Australia, Maybe he's a president, I don't know, but I think it's a prime minister. I remember a prime minister of, of Australia probably 20 years ago when all this Islamic stuff was going on, and they were trying to infiltrate governments and change the laws of governments to match Islam instead of matching what the country was founded on. I remember the prime minister of Australia said, this is a Christian nation, and you folks from Islam, if you don't like it, move back to where you came from because we're not going to comply with your religion. <laughs> I thought, well, that would be, I filed that in the back of my mind, that would be a place to go to if things get really bad in America. Yeah. But it's gotten worse there mm -hmm. than it is in America. Yeah. yeah. Canada's worse than America. Mexico is so corrupt. I don't know where you could go, but that's not the point. The point is, if things got so bad in America that there was a country that actually governed better than America, and you decide to move, denounce your American citizenship and move to that country, is that an act of rebellion? No, it's not. That's an easy one to answer. 
Um, rebellion would be an open defiance, according to the definition, of the established government. What that would mean is to stay in America and start fighting against the government, like the underground weathermen, mm -hmm. back in the 70s, I believe, was when they were blowing up federal buildings and whatnot in America. Mm -hmm. Staying within the country and fighting against the government of the country, that's rebellion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But can the country, the politicians running the country, be rebellious against the citizenry of the country? I believe the answer is probably yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do we have the ability to um, take up arms? And once again, because I said that, I want to clarify, I'm not calling for that at all. Mm -hmm. We're nonviolent, we're Christians. Mm -hmm. But does the citizenry of a country have the right to take up arms against their government if their government becomes tyrannical? Mm -hmm. It depends on the country. Oh, okay. It depends on how that country was established. In America, that's what the Second Amendment is all about in our Constitution. Yeah. The, the, the reason the citizens were given the right to bear arms was so that if their government turns tyrannical, they can turn their arms against their tyrannical government. I'd have to conclude that based, that that based on the fact that that is part of the foundation of America, the answer would be not necessarily an act of rebellion. I, I say not necessarily because it gets very complicated. Yeah. It could be an act of rebellion. I mean, who's the one that decides when it's gone too far? Who's the one that decides when it's become tyrannical? Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 2. As clear back in the New Testament as past Hebrews. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. I'm going to read this verse and then I'm going to talk about some nonviolent acts of rebellion that I've observed in my lifetime. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, God says, now I know that Peter wrote 1 and 2 Peter, but Peter was inspired by the Holy Ghost. And so God said, yeah. not Peter said, right. God said, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of men for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. So we're supposed to submit ourselves yeah. mm -hmm. to those ordinances. And it goes on beyond that. Or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, that little portion of scripture says a lot. Mm -hmm. Who put the person in charge? The Lord. The Lord. Why did he put him in charge? Well, there's two reasons given. One is because of the evil, mm -hmm. and one is because of the good. Yeah. And so you've heard me say that the Bible talks about God's going to give a nation, a state, or whoever the leader that they deserve. Mm -hmm. Yes. If a nation is evil, they're going to get an evil leader. Mm -hmm. yep. If a nation is good, they're going to get a good leader. Some of the best leaders of this, ever, of this country that this country ever saw were leaders that were leaders back when the pulpits were on fire for God and the majority of the mm -hmm. people were Christian. And the folks that, the, the, you know what was the first reader in schools? You know how people were taught mm -hmm. to read? With the yeah, Bible. Bible. Mm -hmm. But some atheists sued and eventually the Bible was taken out of the schools. And they were given C spot run, run spot run, <laughs> instead of the word of God. I think even when I was still in school, I believe, I think I can remember clear back then. I have a terrible memory of my childhood, but um, my mom always thought I blocked out my childhood. That's not true. I just have a terrible me memory of my childhood. 
But I think I can remember back in my earliest grades of school, when we'd show up to school before we start the day, we would have an opening prayer. Yeah. And we'd say the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But some atheists took the school system to court and the prayer was banned in school. Yeah, unfortunately. When I was in high school, now this is not that long ago. Yeah, it's a long time ago. I graduated in the 70s. But mm -hmm. when I was in high school, we had a Bible club, right in high school, Bible club. I don't think you can have a Bible club anymore. But you know what? They have a Satan club now that's being put in schools all over the country. So being that we kicked God out of the schools, we kicked God out of the, you know what? Right in the, all the uh, courthouses and stuff in the country, they have the Ten Commandments posted in there. They have all that's been taken down. So we kicked God out of the schools. Mm -hmm. We kicked God out of the, our government buildings. Mm -hmm. You know why they haven't gone off after in God we trust on the dollar bill and on our coins? It's because it's not God, Jehovah. No. no. If you do some research, you're going to find out that God that they're talking about is Satan. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Little and so they're not going to go after that. No. Because they trust in Satan. Mm -hmm. So we've kicked God, Jehovah out of everything. What kind of leaders do you think we're getting going forward? Ungodly. Yeah, God's, going to show ungodly. God's going to show judgment on America. Amen? Yeah, amen. And so when you consider that commandment that we just read in 1 Peter, it's a commandment of God and it brings home the idea that many who are deeply entrenched in rebellion, going to my very first point that I talked about in this service, if you think about those who are deeply entrenched in rebellion, they don't even believe that they are. No. Not at all. So what we just read in First Peter, did it say submit yourself to the ordinances if they're good? No. No. Did it say submit yourself to the leaders if they're good? No. Well, there goes the whole idea of any rise up within the country, right? If we're going to follow what the Bible says, amen? Amen. Yeah. So... Uh, the point that I, why I'm making that point is because if anybody misreads this message and says, based on what the pastor's saying, we should take up arms, how many times have I said, no, that's not what we do? Mm -hmm. And now I've read your Bible that says, no, you're supposed to submit to that authority. Because yeah. what was the first question we asked? What constitutes lawful authority? And I said right after I asked that question, the Bible has some definition of that. We just read some definition of that. Yeah. Whether it's a good ruler or a bad ruler, they're placed there by God. Yes. <laughs> so if they're placed there by God, is it a lawful authority? Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's something to think about. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about when I talk about folks are heavily engaged in open rebellion and they don't even know that they are. In the past, I've been involved with Christians who were openly involved in tax rebellion, tax revolution, mm -hmm. refusal to pay taxes. And to make it simple, they, they simply refused to pay any taxes, and they justified it by stating that the government does ungodly things with the tax dollars they collect. Mm -hmm. So they, they're justifying their rebellion against taxation and they're saying because they're, they're, they're putting on the holier than thou thing because I'm justified in not paying because they do ungodly things with the money I give them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Will that hold water, that thought? Nope. Mm -hmm. These same people refuse to get driver's license. They don't think that the government has the right to tell them they need a license to drive a car. Does the government have the right to tell you you need a license to drive a car? The answer to that question would be this. Is the government a lawful authority by God's definition? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they are, then they have the right to tell you you need to have a license to drive a car. Mm -hmm. Now, I may be yeah. getting on some folks' fences, and if I am, I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry, because God told me to get on your fence. It's fine getting on your fence. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. 
So let's think about that rebellious act, and I'm calling it a rebellion. They don't see it as rebellion, but it is rebellion. Let's talk about that rebellious act of refusing to pay taxes because they do evil things with the money. Does our government do evil things with tax dollars? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They yeah. subsidize abortions and all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. wickedness. Mm -hmm. It's wickedness. So let's look at some biblical truths. Uh, keep your finger here in 1 Peter. Don't lose it. 1 Peter chapter 2. And turn to Mark chapter 12 and verse 13. Mark chapter 12 and verse 13. And they send unto him, the him is Jesus, and they send unto him certain of the Pharisees of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of man, but teacheth the way of God in truth. So they set him up by throwing compliments. Be careful when somebody's opening up a conversation by giving you all kinds of compliments. Mm -hmm. And so then they bring the question, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Mm -hmm. The question is, hey Jesus, should we pay taxes? That's the question. Mm -hmm. Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And so Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And he pointed out that that money was Caesar's. If we want to make it to America, render to Washington the things that are Washington's, right? Mm -hmm. Render to the capital the things that are the capitals. Right. It's the country that owns the monetary system, not God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, is taxation an ordinance of man? Well, I said to keep your finger in uh, second or First Peter chapter two, and we read verse thirteen, and we should go all the way down through seventeen. We read through fifteen. Fifteen says, "For so is the will of God that well doing." ye may put to silence the ignorance of the foolish man. Now look at verse 16. As free and not using your liberty as a cloak for maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Mm -hmm. well, in America, we don't have a king, but we have a president. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to honor Joe Biden? It is for me. It is. For me too. It's hard for me too. It's hard to honor Joe Biden, but if I'm going to do what the Bible says, should I honor Joe Biden? Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean I have to support him. I want to make sure there's a distinction here because in America, we have elections to determine. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have to vote for Joe Biden in order to show that I'm honoring my president. Mm -hmm. I can say, he's been evil. I'm going to vote for somebody else. Right. <laughs> in order to make this country try and get back to some ground where it's appropriate. Yeah. So that taxation, that taxation, is taxation an ordinance of man? Well, it isn't God that said pay taxes. Yeah. Is taxation an ordinance of man? Yeah. Is it dishonoring the king to violate that order ordinance? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't like taxes any better than anybody else. I don't like where the tax dollars are being spent. I think that most of it is yeah. foolishness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I pay my taxes? Every penny that the government says I owe, I pay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. The next thing that we should consider is the actual government of Rome at the time of Jesus um, 
because they said, I don't give taxation. I don't pay my taxes because they do evil things with the taxes. We've got to turn to the time of when Jesus made his statement there in Mark about render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Mm -hmm. Let's ask some questions about that. Do we think that Rome was a godly government at that time? No. 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 Huh. Do we believe that Rome only did godly things with the tax dollars they collected? And what did Jesus say? Pay your taxes. Give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. Yeah. You see, God's going to take, listen, if we don't have a single dollar bill in our pocket, mm -hmm. God's going to take care of us. He said he'd take care of our name. He didn't say he'd take care of our wants. No. So brother, if you want a brand new pickup that's as nice as mine, you got one that's nicer than mine. I shouldn't use that as an example. Um, what's a good example? If, you, if there's something that, that you want, that God doesn't necessarily have to give you something that you want. He promised to take care of what you need. Mm -hmm. and, what, and the Bible defines what it is we need. What, it is, what does it say? With food and raiment there with be content. Mm -hmm. Not with a massive wardrobe. If you have clothes that you can wear today and you're fed, God's taking care of your needs. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. And there's a reason why I'm focusing on that. We're almost out of time, but... There's a reason why I'm focusing on that. I'm focusing on that because we may be coming upon times when that's what we have. We may be kicked out of our properties. We may yeah. lose our vehicles. We may barely squeak by with the clothes that are on our back, but God will send just enough food that we don't starve to death. Mm -hmm. And it may not even be food that you like to eat. One of my favorite foods is Mexican food. And I love me some tacos and burritos and whatnot. I also love me some pizza. <laughs> but I may get bologna. <laughs> That's a bad example because I love fried bologna. I'm like a southern guy. I like me some fried bologna too. But <laughs> may not even get bologna. I may get... Trip. Whatever. Grits. Grits. <laughs> now, I'm not wild about Grits. <laughs> Especially hominy grits. Hominy grits are... I, I know down south they love their hominy grits. Mm -hmm. If I have my choice, give me some biscuits with some red-eye gravy and I'm good to go. Cat head biscuits and red-eye gravy. Except I don't eat biscuits anymore because they make me fat. Mm -hmm. But um, my, my point is this. We, we, we need to get in a frame of mind where... You know something that would irritate God about Israel? God was taking care of their needs. Mm -hmm. Wasn't taking care of their wants. He was taking care of their needs. Now, he didn't give any of them new clothes. You know what the Bible says? It says their shoes didn't yeah. uh, wear out and their clothes didn't wax old. So whatever they had, God made it last to where they had the same clothes for 40 years. <laughs> yeah. And you know what they had to eat every single meal? Manna. Mm -hmm. yep, yep. A little bread-like thing. And they would gripe and complain. I remember back in Egypt where we had leeks and onions. <laughs> and God would get mad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <clears throat> we need to be in a frame of mind that we don't make God mad. If he right. feeds us manna and gives us the very clothes on our back and we never get another change of clothes, mm -hmm. we need to take on the motto of Paul and say, I find whatever state I'm in therewith to be content. And we're all guilty to some degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's times when I'll say, hey, Lisa, what's for dinner? And she'll say, oh, we're having whatever, a hamburger. Again? We just had hamburgers two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> God probably looks down at that and says, you're a rebellious little stinker. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Do we as Christians have the right to ignore the laws of the land and do whatever we want under the umbrella of our Christianity? No. The Bible said that we submit ourselves to the authorities. Mm -hmm. And it says that God puts in place who he wants in place based on the behavior of the people of that land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. 
So what should we as Christians do here in America? I already said we don't take up arms. We submit to that authority. Yeah. But there so, are things that we can do. We do have a vote. Mm -hmm. We do have the ability to, I don't know, and I don't, I've don't. i done it before. I don't do it. I haven't done it in years and don't do it regularly by any stretch of the imagination. But we have the ability to go to City Hall when they're having a... Uh, town council meeting to talk about the direction of the city. We, we hate what the education system's doing to our kids. We elect the education board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And judges. And judges. We elect judges. You know what right. most people do in, when, with the election of judges? If they're an incumbent judge, they just check yes, vote for them, vote for them, vote for them. You know what at least I do? And it's painstaking. We look up the records of each judge, mm -hmm. and we vote no on probably about half of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they're not godly, and they don't follow the law. No. In I, I don't know if they do it here. You can, yeah. They do it here. Mm -hmm. But in I know in Arizona they used to have where lawyers rated the judge on how well they follow the law, mm -hmm. how well they run their courtroom, whether they're organized. And they have this rating system from the lawyers that work with the judges. It made it fairly easy to do the research. You say they do that here too? And so it makes it fairly easy to do the research, but the research is provided to you. All you got to do is look it up. Instead of just checking, yes, retain, 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 retain. Mm -hmm. Do the same thing that you've always done, and you're going to get the same result. I think yeah. it was Einstein that defined that as insanity, to do the same thing and expect a different result. And so, does that set a good godly example, by rebelling, does it set a good godly example to people of the government that we live in? Mm -hmm. Do you want our gov government, our politicians saying, all oh, those Christians, they rebel against taxation, they rebel against this, they rebel against, is that a good example of for our politicians? Yeah. Yeah. Is it an act of rebellion? You know, rebellion, the thing that God hates? Mm -hmm. Is it an act of rebellion? And I'm going to close on this and we'll, we'll pick up with this topic next week again, but I'm going to close with this. Mm -hmm. The end does not justify the means. Mm -hmm. You... I, I used to, when I was in business, I used to tell my employees all the time, if you want to succeed, you need to do the right things for the right reasons. Amen. You can do the right things for the wrong reasons. That will not lead to success. No. You can do the wrong things for the right reasons. That doesn't lead to success. No. When you start doing the right things for the right reasons, it will almost always bring success. Amen. We need to be careful that we're doing, you know, right now in politics, they believe the ends justifies the means. Mm -hmm. And so they do the wrong things for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They think they're doing the wrong, they know they're doing wrong. They think they're doing the wrong for the right reason. And that's fallacy. That's satanic. You cannot do wrong and expect good. Yeah. So with that, let's go to Lord in prayer and we'll pick up with this topic. Uh, hopefully this isn't super offensive to anybody, but it doesn't matter. God gave it to me to preach. So Lord, we do thank you for your word. We pray that you'd use it however you see fit. And God, that you just bless it. We love you. And give us, just watch over us in this country that we're living. We do pray for our politicians. Lord, we pray that America could somehow, some way before the rapture, Return to some form of godliness. Lord, that we can live in peace with the government. Uh, we Christians, that we can live in peace with the government until you rapture us out of here. We, we beg for your mercy. We beg for your grace. Lord, that you would um, return soon and that you'd... I look forward to the rapture, Lord. I, I look forward to it every single day. And Lord, we just pray for your blessings on the folks as they go their way. And that you bring us back on Wednesday. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Was that fun? So <laughs>